By 1945, Adolf Hitler's lust for power had left millions dead and Europe in ruins. Now Germany's leaders would pay for his crimes. Defendant Hermann Wilhelm Goering. The International Military Tribunal sentences you to death by hanging. Fritz Sauble, death by hanging. This was justice. But for some, especially survivors of the Holocaust, it wasn't enough. Every Jew after the Holocaust nourished and fostered an idea that once the war is over, he, she will take revenge on the Germans. After the war, some did take revenge. They were going with their British uniforms, arresting those people, making these people confess, and killing them. Their targets would have little chance to make their case. But one group would seek vengeance on a different scale. They saw themselves as the representatives or the embodiment of the Jewish nation. They believed that since six million Jews had died in the Holocaust, six million Germans should pay with their lives. Death would be in the drinking water. To kill six million Germans, that's even insane to say that. It would be revenge according to the Old Testament. This is the story of the Jewish Avengers. For the rest of the world, the war ended in 1945. But for the Avengers, it was just beginning. In the months following the end of the Second World War, Europe was in chaos. Millions of refugees were on the road. And the Allies were struggling to deal with huge numbers of surrendering German soldiers. Undoubtedly hiding among them were countless war criminals. Yet most of these men were, in the end, simply allowed to go home. It was a situation that some found intolerable. One of them was Heim Miller, now in his 80s and living on an Israeli kibbutz. Miller is a veteran of a unit called the Jewish Brigade. The Jewish Brigade was in fact part of the British Army, though its recruits were mostly composed of Jews from the Middle East and Europe. In 1945, the Brigade was briefly stationed in northern Italy. But with the fighting over, Miller and his friends, without the knowledge of their British commanders, decided to hunt down and kill anyone they thought was a war criminal. So they put on the trucks, the Juden coming, the Jews are coming, to frighten the population. The Juden coming, this means revenge is on the way. Brigade revenge squads always used their British uniforms, pretending to be on official business. Suspected war criminals would be lured into their vehicles and driven to a remote spot. Asum 
בדרך כלל לא הכחישו, זה נכון, זה נכון, זה נכון, זה נכון. נו, אז אחרי חצי שנה אמרו לו, שמע, אם כל זה עשית וכל זה נכון, אז מה מגיע לך? והוא נשאר ביער, לא יצא יותר מהיער. Between 1945 and 1946, when they were disbanded, Jewish brigade soldiers are thought to have executed several hundred suspected war criminals. והוא חפר חפר שהיה קצת יותר עמוק שאפשר לשכב בפנים. בום וזהו. The Jewish Brigade's call of war criminals was confined to northern Italy and the Austrian border. But they weren't the only ones who craved summary justice. Across Europe, other groups of Jewish Avengers were also making their presence felt. One of them was led by an ex-Jewish freedom fighter from the Lithuanian city of Vilna. His name was Abba Kovna. In 1941, the Germans had occupied the Baltic states, including Lithuania, Kovna's home. Almost immediately, Nazi death squads had begun killing Jews, who were being herded into ghettos across the region. In Vilna, the 23-year-old Kovna knew that Jews were being taken outside the city to be killed. He was told by a friend, who'd seen the genocide for himself in the Ponar forest. That friend still uses the pseudonym Menachem. They took us in to collect bodies of dozens and dozens of people who tried to escape and were killed. Mothers holding children and young couples embracing each other and you should take all these people and throw them into the pit. These were things you can't forget. The murder of Jews in the Ponar forest had enraged Kovna. Many in the ghetto refused to believe it was happening, but Kovna begged them to listen. Years later, he remembered his original call to arms, a rousing speech made inside a ghetto soup kitchen in 1941. <laughs> Kovna was a personality you couldn't ignore, whose vision and whose thoughts about Jewish history were of the highest level. You could either hate him, and there were people who hated him, he had his arrogance, but also others who thought that he gave them goals and they followed him for the goals. Kovna, together with several hundred volunteers, decided to fight back. Having escaped from the ghetto, he now led a four-year guerrilla war against the Nazis, ambushing German patrols and targeting supply trains.
With Allied victory in 1945, many Jewish partisans returned to their homes and began to settle old scores, both with the Nazis and their collaborators. We don't know how many, we don't know exactly, but we know from survivors that groups who came back from the forests and out of the hidings came back to the original places, found out who was it that uh, killed their families and their community, took them out and shot them. But for Abakovna, this wasn't enough. Leaving the lynch mobs to others, he decided to set up his own private army. From Vilna, he already knew partisans who shared his goals. Among them Menachim, who'd witnessed the horrors of Pona, and Vitka Kempner, who'd fought by Kovna's side in the Vilna ghetto. She later became his lover but he also recruited new members. Pasha Reichman was one, a partisan from the Ukraine. In the memoirs that, that my father left, he describes his first meeting with Abba Kovner, and um, at a certain point, my father said to Abba that he felt that he could not leave Europe before settling the score uh, with the Germans, at which point Abba Kovner sprang to his feet and, and hugged him and kissed him, and. Uh, he was besides himself with joy and he felt a tremendous sense of relief at hearing these words and he said but this is what I've been feeling all along and they were very very happy to find each other. With Reichmann and others on board Kovna soon had around 50 volunteers. He now gave them a name. Nakam, the Hebrew word for revenge. But before he could begin his own Nazi hunt, he first had another job. The Brika, or Exodus, was a massive movement of Jews after the war from Europe to the Middle East. In 1945, there was, as yet, no state of Israel. Instead, Palestine, as it was then called, was controlled by the British. Fearing Arab unrest, they had restricted the number of Jewish immigrants to 10,000 a year. It was a policy they rigorously enforced. Abba Kovna, a passionate Zionist was appalled. He now decided to help smash the British blockade. From the summer of 1945, the Nakam was heavily involved in smuggling Jews to Palestine. But even as Kovna aided the Bricha, he was at the same time plotting a monumental act of revenge. The Nakam's targets would not be one or two Nazis who'd got away, but instead, the entire populations of four German cities. Nuremberg, Hamburg, Frankfurt, and Munich. In charge of logistics for the operation was a young Auschwitz survivor, Yehuda Maimon. The mass murder of six million German citizens would be carried out by contaminating water supplies with a poison. To kill six million Germans, that's, that's even insane to say that. Which six million? Where? How? Why? 
there is every reason to believe that most of them didn't do anything to harm the Jewish people. But Kovna was serious. His idea to poison the water supplies of four major cities, known simply as Plan A, was deliberately random. Kovna wanted Germans to experience the horror of indiscriminate murder, just as the Jews had done. But to murder six million Germans through their tap water would take meticulous planning. Immediately, Kovna dispatched small Nakam cells to each of the target cities. First of all, they investigated how the water supply was distributed in all these cities. They had people uh, posing like workers, like engineers. They, they, they used all these kind of disguises to get into the, the mains, to get the plans in the city halls, and they succeeded to get the, the, the full plans. They found the mains where they could actually pour the poison into the, the pipes. By August 1945, the Nakam were now close to making the attack possible. But before they could strike, Kovna hesitated. Leaving his teams in Germany, he now traveled alone to Palestine. He'd come to secure the blessing of the Jewish leadership. Unhappy with British rule in Palestine, the most important faction known as the Haganah had, since the 1920s, won its own defense force in the region. Now, increasingly involved in politics, many believed that when the British finally pulled out of Palestine, it would be the Haganah who would take the reins of power. I became and met with the leaders of Palestine. Not with all of them, but with some of them. And uh, they all reported to Ben-Gurion. David Ben-Gurion was the acknowledged leader of the Haganah. His dream was of an independent Jewish state, which would soon rise out of the ashes of the Holocaust. But it quickly became apparent that Ben-Gurion had no stomach for revenge on such a scale. David Ben-Gurion put it very simply. If you kill six million Germans, will it bring back to life my six million Jews? If not, I'm not interested. Ben-Gurion's opposition to revenge was a huge setback for Kovna. But fueled with hatred for the Germans, he refused to take no for an answer, attempting instead to sell his idea to somebody else. Meeting at the White House, Dr. Chaim Weizmann, the guest of U.S. President Harry Truman. Second only to Ben-Gurion himself, Chaim Weizmann was one of the Jewish people's most revered figureheads. Destined to become the first president of Israel, he was also a world-renowned chemist based at the Seif Institute near Tel Aviv, a building today renamed in his honor. Kovna would later claim not only to have received Weizmann's blessing, but also that Weizmann had helped him obtain the poison he needed for his attack. The poison came from two brothers, Ephraim and Aharon Katsir. The Katsirs were microbiologists at Weizmann's lab, and they were now, according to Kovna, instructed by Weizmann to give him the poison he needed. But 
were the Katsia brothers ever told of the plan to kill six million? And was Weizmann even involved at all, as Kovner later claimed? Others, however, believe differently. Some claim Weizmann wasn't even in Palestine when Kovner visited in 1945. He came to have support and authorization and confirmation from the leadership here, and he didn't get it. And he couldn't go back to his Avengers and say, Kinderlach, no one wants us. No one wants us to do that. So he made up the story. Whatever the truth, Back in Europe, the people of Germany carried on with their daily lives, oblivious to the impending attack. Hidden amongst them, Kovner's sleeper cells knew nothing of the political maneuvering going on in Palestine. But the strain of waiting, month after month, was beginning to tell. I believe to be very strong because you could see the Germans being in, in a tram or in a bus or somewhere and you could uh, hear people speaking against the Jews. They had no money, they had no work. They lived under an assumed identity. They were cut off from everyone, they were isolated because the idea of revenge ate them up. By December 1945, Kovner had finally got his poison and was ready to return to Germany. Taking it with him, he slipped onto a British destroyer in Alexandria. But he never made it. For reasons which even today remain unclear, Kovner was arrested on board ship. Though not before dumping the poison over the side. News of the arrest soon reached Europe. At a certain stage, I got an order to hold with the water. But Menachem was still hopeful. I wasn't told that it's stopped. I was told that it's on ice. Which meant the day will come, we'll do it. Countless Germans had been saved. But Kovner's arrest remained shrouded in mystery. Even today, people wonder what had really happened. There was talk of maybe Abba having changed his mind or uh, even betrayed the cause, and it was a very serious crisis. Whatever the truth, Kovner was now in jail. Plan A was in crisis. However, he still wasn't out of the fight. In Europe, the rest of the Nakam quickly regrouped. Even without their leader, they had decided to carry on. When he lost or threw the, the poison that he acquired into the Mediterranean, they went on without him. They didn't need him 
because they were already fully taken by the idea that you cannot come back to normal life without a, a punishing the perpetrators. From now on, Paris would be Nakam headquarters. Here, Pasha Reichmann took charge of European operations, with Kovner's lover, Witka Kempner, working alongside. Plan A may have been history, but now it was time to launch Kovner's Plan B. Plan B now focused on Nuremberg. Devastated by Allied bombing, the city was in ruins. But Kovner still had a Nakam cell positioned there. Leading it was his old friend from the Vilna ghetto, Menachim. I was very happy that Abai appointed me for uh, Nuremberg. Nuremberg was the city of the Nazis. All the military parades which you see today on the movies. We are in Nuremberg. In defeat, the Nazi parade ground now stood idle. Instead, all eyes were on the Allied war crimes trials taking place at the Palace of Justice. The old Palace of Justice at Nuremberg stages what may, without exaggeration, be called the greatest trial in the annals of the human race. The men who not long ago bestrode the continent of Europe and committed mass crime on a scale which staggers the imagination are today in the dock. Some of the Nakam wanted to storm the courtroom itself assassinating Nazis in the dock. But security was tight, and the idea was dismissed as too dangerous. Instead, Kovner's Plan B now focused on another part of the city. After defeat in 1945, Many of Germany's prison camps were used to hold surrendering Nazis. In Nuremberg, the Allies now held many thousands. Amongst them, former SS death camp personnel, Gestapo officers, and other high-ranking Nazis. Many were implicated in war crimes. And then a camp now planned to kill them. Plan B was a much smaller proposition than Plan A. But once again, the chosen method was poison. Close to a camp called Stalag 13, Menachem had identified a bakery which supplied the SS prisoners with their daily ration of bread. Now he needed to work out a way of poisoning it. They took a man of ours and I helped him to get into the bakery, or the bread, and he learned everything. Lepke Distel was Menachem's man on the inside. For weeks, he played the role of trainee baker to perfection. Meanwhile, in Paris, a chemist sympathetic to the cause was brought in to supply a large quantity of arsenic. This was then smuggled to Menachim in Nuremberg. This time, nothing went wrong. The material which was brought to me was brought by a soldier from the Jewish brigade, and it was in hot water bottles bound around his body. We smuggled in the bottles into the bakery. So we created a place to hide under the wooden floor in case of something, which was very useful 
and we kept two more bottles in reserve. And then we decided that, that we were ready to do it. In the small hours of April the 13th, 1946, Distel, having hidden in a basket as the other bakers left for home, now began preparing the poison. Working with two accomplices he'd smuggled inside, there was very little time. These people in, at night were standing in a bakery and preparing the, the poison, and others were uh, just putting it on the bread. Each poisoned loaf would, within hours, be cut into quarters and served to four Nazi prisoners. They smelled 3,000 breads, which was enough for 12,000 bastards. As dawn arrived, the poisoned bread made its way to the prison camp. But had the plan worked? A day later, snippets of information suggested it had. Menachem now brought in an old friend to find out more. He'd met Rachel Glicksman in Vilna after the war. Now in Nuremberg, she was dispatched to find out what had happened at the camp. for the Nakam, it was another failure. Had the poison simply made the SS inmates ill? I don't know how many, but what I know is that the American army has mobilized all the ambulances, and they had thousands, and they were carrying them to all the possible hospitals, and they were pumping them, pumping out. Despite American attempts to play the attack down, on April the 24th, the story went global. The American press reported nearly 2,300 Nazi victims were in hospital, but again, no deaths. I didn't feel comfortable because I did hope for more. But what could I do? Maybe the material wasn't strong enough. All the Avengers regretted the failure of the Stalag 13 bread poisoning. But what hurt even more was the fact that the first plan, the murder of six million Germans, was never even attempted at the time. <laughs> Pasha Reichman, Kovner's fellow Avenger, also regretted the failure of Plan A. My father always was of the opinion that it should have been carried out. At the same time, he was very proud of being one of the authors of uh, this chapter in Jewish history. It conveyed the message to the world, to, to future generations, that uh, Jewish blood could not be spilt with impunity. <laughs> Hargulano Shishi Million, Kamanach Miodim Laharogota.
שישה מיליון. עין תחת עין, בדיוק. If you ask me if I say the same thing today, yes, the same thing. I say that we were right. Some of them say until today, I would have done it. I would have done it. Today it's easy to say that. Kovner once said, when you heard about the American atomic bomb thrown on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Had I had an atomic bomb, I would have let it fall on Germany. And they would have known that those who came out of Auschwitz would not have let this happen again. After a year in jail, Kovner was released. The question was, what would he do next? If he did have thoughts of vengeance, these were soon overtaken by momentous events now taking place in the Middle East. First films from Jerusalem as the clock runs out to mark the end of British rule. As the zero hour approaches, General Sir Alan Cunningham, High Commissioner for Palestine, and other British officers lead the forces that leave the Holy City for the final time. In 1948, the British withdrew from Palestine. On the 14th of May, David Ben-Gurion formally declared an independent state of Israel. Almost immediately, the state of Israel came under attack as several Arab states invaded. Israel in its first years was really struggling for survival. It had to fight five or six Arab countries which were determined to destroy it and to annihilate it and to drown it in blood and all these kind of terrible threats. So all the efforts, all the energy was channeled into survival. Kovner now had a choice to go back to Germany and try once more to avenge the victims of the Holocaust, or to give up Nazi hunting and defend his new country. Kovner, choose Israel. The moment Abba Kovner came to Israel, he became an officer in one of the most famous fighting units in the South. And he devoted himself to the war with all the fire which was burning in him. So all the fire which burned for the revenge burned now for fighting for the, for the sake of Israel. And for him it was a different chapter. Kovner wasn't alone in giving up Nazi hunting. David Ben-Gurion's new government was, if anything, more opposed to revenge than it had ever been. In fact, my father once uh, personally met uh, Ben-Gurion and tried to bring him over to the idea of exacting their, their own kind of vengeance. And to that, Ben-Gurion responded by saying, well, vengeance, oh, what a nice sign sounding word. I'm all for vengeance. You know what vengeance would be for me? Vengeance would be if you could take six million Germans and, took, and, and turn them into, into six million Jews and bring them over to Israel to settle the land. Now that, that would be uh, my kind of vengeance. But I'm totally uninterested in, in what you see as vengeance. Ben-Gurion may have turned his back on Nazi hunting, but back in Europe, other Jewish Avengers decided to keep going. In 1949, Wilhelm Stuckart, a Nazi lawyer who drew up the justification for the final solution, died in a mysterious car accident. 1954, Otto Abetz, German ambassador to France during the occupation, was also found dead in a burning vehicle. 
1976, SS Tank Commander Joachim Piper, said to have ordered the murder of American prisoners of war in 1944, was tracked to his retirement home in France and killed in a firebomb attack. Claims that these and other Nazi deaths were the result of Avenger attacks remain hard to prove. But one thing is beyond doubt. 20 years after the war ended, Israel changed its position on Nazi hunting. In 1963, David Ben-Gurion stepped down as Prime Minister. Now his country's relaxed policy on revenge was quietly rewritten. In particular, the rules of engagement at Mossad, the Israeli intelligence service, were changed. Mossad agents were fit, highly motivated and superbly trained. Experts in sabotage and psychological warfare. Their ranks were largely comprised of ex-underground fighters, Jewish partisans who'd arrived from Europe after the war, and some Avengers. By the 1960s, Mossad had become one of the most efficient and ruthless intelligence services in the world. We are talking about the 60s, and uh, I believe that the Mossad received a pretty liberal uh, carte blanche kind of uh, order. If you find a Nazi and you know he's a Nazi and uh, you can either kidnap him or liquidate him, uh, go ahead. In 1964, a Mossad agent traveled to Sao Paulo in Brazil. His orders were to hunt down a suspected war criminal called Herbert Sukers. Sukers, from Lithuania, one of the Baltic states, was accused of collaborating with the Nazis during the war. Employed as a military policeman in the capital city Riga, Sukers was said to have helped his German masters to round up and liquidate the Jews. Sukos was physically and personally involved in, in killing at least 30,000 Jews. He personally threw 300 Jews into a synagogue and burned it down with them inside and carried out terrible crimes. One day he appeared in the ghetto riding a horse with a shining leather coat and, and, and shooting a baby from, from, from you know, from zero meters, you know, from, from no distance at all, just, you know, to show that he's the man, he got the power, he got the authority. Sukers would later be christened the hangman of Riga. But since the end of the war, he'd never been called to account for his crimes. Instead, he'd escaped to South America, where 20 years later, Mossad agent Anton Kunzler tracked him down. His house was like a fortress. He, all the time, he expected that one day the Avengers will come and find him there. And he note, made notes of any suspicious person who was coming. Anybody suspected, it was a note in his notebooks. And he was very, 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 uh, I would say, protective. He knew something is going to happen. Posing as an Austrian businessman, Kunzler made contact at a marina where Sukers operated a small sightseeing business. Sukers was very suspicious all the time. Uh, I told him I can take you for a flight around the Sao Paulo and see what's going on. And uh, he said, OK. And they went for a short flight. And uh, after this, uh, uh, Sukers was uh, enough impressed by um, by Anton Künzler's hints that he's a businessman and he's looking for, for investors and he's looking for partners, etc. He invited him to have a drink on his small boat. And from this moment on, Zucco started eating the bait that Künzler gave him. After befriending and gaining Zucco's trust over four weeks, Kunzler lured his prey to the city of Montevideo in Uruguay.
Waiting at a suburban house were other members of the Mossad team. The plan was to restrain Sukas, hold a brief trial, then kill him. But what they hadn't counted on was Sukas' will to live. They were equipped with a handgun with a silencer, which at the beginning didn't work. So the struggle was a real, really physical struggle, you know. And as far as I understand, there was also a very heavy five kilo hammer involved in it. He said something in German, lass mich sprechen, you know, let, me, let me talk, let me talk. But then the gun with the silencer uh, came back to action and they shot him twice in the head. Seven days later, police entered the house. Inside, the body had been left in a trunk. Above it was a folder. It contained a note stating Sukas had been condemned to death by those who will never forget. The hunt for the hangman of Riga was over. The murder of Herbert of a Nazi war criminal that Israel has ever admitted to though some believe it's not the only killing they've carried out. We know that the Mossad went after some of the main perpetrators and killed them off in Chile, in Argentina, in here and there. But that, uh, that's not public. Revenge should have been public. Mossad may have remained discreet, but in recent years, many other Avengers have, for the first time, admitted their roles in bold and sometimes shocking operations. Men like Chaim Miller, member of the Jewish Brigade's assassination squad. Yehuda Maimon, Abakovna's head of logistics. And Menachim, leader of Nakam's Nuremberg cell. Despite these and other confessions, no one has ever been tried for the revenge killing of a Nazi. Certainly not Abba Kovna, leader of the Nakam, who by his death in 1987 was celebrated in Israel as a poet and a national hero. After the war, the world did legitimately hunt down Nazis. But out of an estimated 150,000 possible war criminals, it's thought only one in 10 was ever officially held to account. For Kovna and his fellow Avengers, those who delivered the Holocaust had simply not paid a high enough price. מי שרוצה דרך אמר יהודי, הוא חייב לשלם אף על זה. וזה חייב לשלם עם, עם גרמני, שהוא עשה זה לעם יהודי. כל מה שעשינו, אני לא מצטער על שום דבר, לא רק שאני לא מצטער, אלא עשינו פחות מדי. כי מה שאתם עשיתם עם שישה מיליון יהודים, אפשר להשוות? The loss is not only six millions, it's six million generations, and that nobody counts. <laughs> 